You are listening to Be The Change, a podcast of conversations with true visionaries who are creating new paradigms for a healthier planet and society. I am your host, Christine Demick, and my work is in finding real solutions to the biggest problems we face today, climate crisis, capitalism, social injustices, and our failing health. There are amazing humans out there that have answers, and it is my mission to have their voices heard. Together, we can raise consciousness and create a just and equal society. Together, we can be the change. Today, I am speaking with bee health expert Noah Wilson Rich, a doctor of bees. He holds a PhD in bee health and co-founder slash chief scientific officer of the Best Bees Company. Noah's incredible work and research on bees is being used by NASA, MIT, Harvard, and National Geographic. Oh, and you may have caught one of his many TED Talks that has millions of views. A self-proclaimed protector of the bees, Noah joins me today to discuss his decades-long research of bees, why we need to protect them, and how city dwellers may be the answer to increasing the health and population of these magnificent creatures. Welcome, Noah. Thank you so much, Christine. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited. I'm thrilled to have you here. And as I said before, I'm kind of geeking out here about having this incredible opportunity to speak with you. Your work in bees is profound. I'm grateful to have you here to share your knowledge with me and everyone listening. So thank you. Your education and knowledge on it is unsurpassed, in my opinion. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's awesome. And, you know, anybody who eats food needs bees. So it's really important to talk about it. Yes, everyone. Like, okay, so first, let's start. Like, why bees? What led you on this path? Oh, it's so funny. You know, I remember as a kid hearing about you know, the world and so many different big problems. And I remember thinking, how can we make an impact? How can we really make a difference to make the world a better place? You know, we're only on this world for such a short time. It's part of what you tackle with the Be the Change podcast. I mean, I love this. And so what do we do as individual people and especially kids? What do we do to pick a career that can really make positive change. And so I remember thinking about food and how hunger was such a problem for other kids around the world. And I grew up with a single parent, a couple kids, and, you know, she worked really hard as a school teacher in New York City, my mother. And so I was thinking about how do we feed everybody? And then I was learning about pollinators and how if we can make sure that pollinators are healthy, then they can bring food to people around the world. So it seemed like if we can combine our efforts into helping pollinators, then we can really make a big impact. And by grad school, I was able to start that work. Amazing. So wait, first, you're a New York City boy? Yeah, born in New York City, born in Manhattan, grew up in Connecticut. All right. All right. (laughs) I love that. And my parents were single. My dad proposed to my mom at a Mets game, Shea Stadium on the big screen. Like, who does that? My parents. And then they had this dream. They were in Murray Hill, you know, going to Studio 54 in the 70s. And then they uh, moved to Connecticut to get married, had two kids, a boy and a girl, and lived happily ever after. Incredible. That's an incredible story. So bees, like you mentioned, like they feed us. I don't think people realize how important our bees are. Can you kind of give us a picture of what it would look like a world without bees? Oh my gosh, totally. You know, a world without bees, we wouldn't be without food. We would just be eating a lot of grains. (laughs) And so, you know, it wouldn't be really the diet that everybody's thinking about these days. It'd be very starchy. When you see flowers out, flowers formed because of this love affair around 100 million years ago with pollinators. We started the world first saw that long ago butterflies and bees, and these were kind of cousins of meat-eating insects. Not to go too deep in it, but wasps are meat eaters, and hornets and yellow jackets, they are all meat eaters. They've been around, but 100 million years ago, these malformations happened in plants that turned into flowers. And so these particular wasps started to feed off of the nectar that came from them. And then over time, this love affair formed fruits. So you can think about the secret sex life of plants. It starts with the flower. That's kind of the female parts. And when you're spreading pollen, like what makes you sneeze, that's actually plant sperm. And so a pollinator will bring that pollen, the male part, to the flower, the female part. And then when that plant is pregnant, it forms a fruit, like a delicious tart apple or a sour cherry or even a crunchy almond. 
all of those fruits and nuts and seeds that we eat and enjoy and rely upon for good nutrition, fruits and vegetables, those come because our pollinators are helping them and helping them reproduce. And that contributes over $100 billion every year to the global economy. Now, are bees, they're not native to North America, right? Did we colonize bees? I mean, we brought them from Europe. Oh, it's so interesting to think about the history of this. So a lot of history, 100 million years going, there are 200,000 species of pollinators. So when you think about species, you know, homo sapiens, like us humans, we're so diverse, but we're just one species. Even dogs, as diverse as they are, one species. So diversity in pollinators, there's so many, really because of so many different flowers. They all kind of mated and paired off, and, and they did this process called co-evolution. So there's a lot of diversity there. Now, bees make up about 10% of all pollinators. So there are 20,000 species of bees. Of those in North America, you know, we're talking New York today, we've got 4,000 native species of bees. We've got maybe, you know, 350, 400 of those are native to New York, which is pretty cool. We don't notice them. Many of them are solitary. And so when we do what we call a pollinator safari, even if you walk through Central Park and you just try to notice what bugs do we see? What's on a flower? So many of those, we don't know what to call them. They haven't been well studied. But when we think about honeybees, they're actually not native to the Americas. So they're not one of the 4,000 that are from here. We did bring those when we colonized North America. So when Europeans came over, like the pilgrims, they brought pollinators because they understood that those were so important for bringing food and for farming. And so when we think about honeybees, they've been established in the Americas for about 400 years. Humans have been working with honeybees to pollinate crops since Egypt about 9,000 or so years ago when they put beehives on rafts floating down the Nile River to start pollinating the agricultural lands that were developing there. So the human relationship with honeybees goes way back. But you're right. No, honeybees are not native to the Americas. Interesting. So all bees pollinate, but not all bees are honeybees? Yeah, that's exactly right. And they pollinate differently. And this is really fun to learn about. And so you can think about like the dances of bees. You can think about bumblebees. They're kind of fat. Most people know about bumblebees. They kind of bumble around. They might startle us in the garden. When bumblebees visit flowers, they do what's called buzz pollination. So they do, they shake their butts. They're like, bzzz, and they can get pollen to dislodge from flowers in a mechanism that's similar to a salt and pepper shaker. They've got to shake the pollen out to release it. Honeybees aren't big, fat, and juicy, and they just can't shake the pollen out in that same way. Honeybees are different. They're cute, and they roll around in the pollen. So honeybees can kind of pick up the pollen that's already dropped, but they can't shake it out in buzz pollination. And the point here being that all bees pollinate differently. And there's some bees that are called squash bees or blueberry bees. And they're really good at pollinating squash and blueberries. And they just do it in different ways. And this is all happening right under our noses. And it's kind of this beauty of what I call backyard biology. There's so much to learn. It's just fascinating. I and mean, first of all, I'm feeling like I'm going to sneeze. I'm suffering from allergies. And now it's just like, now I realize this. Like, I'm forever going to think of whenever I sneeze it, it's, it's bee sperm. And... <laughs> <laughs> which is an interesting I know the more right? you know. <laughs> and I also love too like I mean your specific area of study was bee immunology is that right yes it was okay really specific that, to get a real job <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask you what that is but I also my I have a 14 year old son who's you know he's picking his high school now and big science math geek but also a cook and to me like I'm hearing here like about the bees and how, you know, it's all interconnected, right? You know, it's important for a cook to understand about bees. So tell me about immunology and, and what that is. And Yeah, I mean, Christine, bees are the tie that binds in a way that we don't even understand because so many of us, we grow up and we're like, ew, a bug. You know, we want to run from spiders. And, and I get that because evolution favored more cautious people. The ones that stopped and didn't run probably got picked off a long time ago in evolution and history. History. So we have so much in common. And I really love when bringing down to food and hearing about your son and his passion. I hope you're eating well. I hope he shares. Yeah. That. <laughs> 
You know, it really comes down to health and nutrition. And so when I think about bee immunology, I think about what keeps them healthy. They're social animals, just like we humans are. And so I was always fascinated in understanding what we can learn about our social human selves from social bees. We can't do so many experiments on humans, but when we're thinking about bees and what keeps them healthy, despite not having doctors, bees don't have nurses, hospitals, pharmacies, and yet they've stayed healthy for so much longer than we humans have. We've only been around for tens of thousands of years. So what lessons can we learn about their health? What can we understand about the concept of social health? What's the immunology of a society? You know, especially in times of a pandemic, what lessons can we learn from the beehive? And then also, how do we get people to connect with that in ways that make their food almost taste better across cultures? Because there are bees everywhere. And so whether we're here in New York or whether we're in Ghana or India, everybody uses honey and everybody has special recipes and they connect across generations. So it's this beautiful interweaving of information that really makes me passionate. So I went on a trip to Morocco and we were up in the mountains and they sell honey on the side of the road. Have you been there? Have you been to Morocco? I did do a day trip to Morocco with my father. We were in Spain and and you can see Tangiers from... Yeah. We were on um, Gibraltar. Yeah, on a clear yes. day. And my dad was like, do you want to go? And I thought, what? And it was amazing. I have to go back. What you else have to go you back. Have? Did you have any honey from there? Yeah. So there was, we were on, pulled over on the side of the road and it was on our way to, I think it was Agadir from Marrakesh. Mm. And so they sell honey and there was many different kinds and you could taste it. There's a eucalyptus honey. There was certain flowers, certain orange flower honey. And then I also had the chance, I I spoke at the UN in Geneva. And when I was there, I got honey from there, that specific European honey, which is quite different. And I will say, I think better than some of the honey that we have in the Americas, right? You can taste it. And I have some in my cupboard right now. It's a honeysuckle honey. And you can taste the honeysuckle flower in there. So I'm going to tie this into when we talk about urban beekeeping and some of the studies you did, but that's important, right? Like you've done genetic testing on bees, like about their honey and where they're getting the flowers from. And yeah, I mean, Christine, you know, science has to be rooted in your experience, exactly as you're saying, whether it's your travels, your family, like with your son, or even as you shared with me before, your family history with the Garden Club of America, with being so rooted in not only your hobbies and your culture, but then you take it to your activism, whether it's working and, you know, talking about pesticides, with legislators or at the UN. I mean, that is, what did you speak about at the UN, Christine? Pesticides, uh, environmental Uh, toxins, yeah. I mean, you know, it's rooted in your experience. And I think that that's what makes people listen. You know, instead of just preaching, you're saying, you know, here's who I am, here's where I'm from and here's what I'm seeing. And I want to share this with you because it's important. And so exactly as you're saying, honey, it's just flower juice. All honeys are different. And so when you taste honey, you're tasting the land. And that's why it's so important to get to meet a beekeeper, because then you hear about that person's experience. Where's this from? What's your land like? Do you have to be working with pesticides? You know, how does that get into your honey? How might that impact the quality of it? For my work as a scientist, I look at honey as an information tool because it's a snapshot in time, right? When you get honey, honey is the only food that doesn't spoil, So you can eat honey from the pyramids in Egypt. I mean, of course, we would want to preserve that. (laughs) But I mean, if you... I I really want to taste that, Noah. (laughs) No, exactly. I mean, if you tasted it, you would be tasting Egypt from thousands of years ago in the same way that you did with Morocco or Geneva or honeysuckle. The more information that we can gain out of that honey better informs our, our food experience. And it also helps our storytelling to understand maybe what we've lost or how things have changed, or with climate change, how things are changing. Also, natural disasters. With honey, it gives us a snapshot of all of the plant DNA that was present in an environment, let's say California, before wildfires versus after wildfires. So we can know not only what we've lost, what's not there anymore, but we can know what bounces back faster. By looking at the honey after a natural disaster, let's say a tsunami in Japan, a hurricane in Puerto Rico, we can say, huh, this is coming up fast. So these plants are the most resilient. 
And maybe if we plant more of these in a certain way that's determined by the local community, we can increase our resiliency against climate change and natural disasters just by understanding what plant DNA is in honey, which tells us what we're tasting as food. So it's all right under our noses, all this information is in our kitchen cabinets, and it really just requires us coming together and having conversations that may lead to it to help us reveal what we already secretly know. That would be incredible. Do you have, like, I envision your lab has uh, shelves of just honeys from all over the world and cities? And We have a great collection, yeah. You know, we also partner with communities. That's really where it's at. So, um, for example, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, there's a great company called Follow the Honey. And Mary Canning is the founder, and she is so passionate about following honey back to where it's from. And if you have you ever been to a honey store? I know you went to one on the side of the road in Morocco, probably very similar. I mean, they just have different selections when you experience No, it. I haven't. Where where do these exist, these honey stores? Well, Follow the Honey is at 1132 Mass Ave in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I don't own it. I just, you know, such a big fan. And followthehoney.com, I'm sure, is their website. The purpose there is to be able to connect people to that experience because when you taste honey from like there, Tasmania and Australia and, you know, anywhere around the world, you're starting to learn about the land in ways that we never understood before. So that's one of our partners that we love to go to and say, hey, do you have any honey from, you know, working with the government of Haiti or Ethiopia? Let's get a sample. We found three samples of honey from the Himalayan northern region of India and tested those. And we found that most of those are from oak trees. And so we thought, wow, oak, just like in New York, we're finding a lot of tree honey from the honey locust tree. So if we're seeing a lot of honey from trees, then we can work with governments and let them know, hey, if you have a choice of what tree to plant in an area, consider a pollinator tree. Maybe this, not that type of information that can make our cities more sustainable by supporting our pollinators. That's incredible. So this is an amazing segue into where I do want to get to is in your work. So you're the chief scientific officer of the Best Bees Company, which in turn supports a nonprofit called the Urban Beekeeping Laboratory. And that is where I, I want to get to. That's how I found you. As you mentioned, we were talking about the you know pollinator pathway. And what was so amazing to me, Noah, was the Urban Beekeeping Laboratory talks about how bees thrive in the cities. It's not the suburbs or the country, but it's the cities and the data you're collecting, this honey and how important it is. So let's talk about that. Yeah. So we operate in what's called a commercial co-venture. And that's been a a wonderful opportunity where we have a for-profit and a non-profit in a partnership. So we've got the Best Bees Company that does beekeeping. So we install and fully manage beehives at home gardens and business rooftops in a way that just didn't exist before. Before it was, if you wanted bees, become a beekeeper. And now we've been creating jobs for beekeepers across 14 cities to install and manage beehives in their own communities. The clients keep all the honey and we collect research data from each beehive to better understand bee health. And that data then goes towards our nonprofit research lab. So as you mentioned, the Urban Beekeeping Laboratory. And there they analyze the data and they report the trends that they're seeing. And some of those reports have led us to the TED stage. So for more info, people can check out TED.com. I know that you've seen some of my talks there. We love to share the information in a way that's accessible. So it's not just in a scientific journal where you have to pay $20 to read an article. We do that too, of course, but we want to share this more. So National Geographic, we shared a piece about our honey DNA results. And and I think it was the July 2018 issue where we uh, published results from eight or so cities, including New York and Boston and San Francisco and Denver all around to say, here's what we're seeing. This is the type of honey that comes out of your cities. If you have local honey in Boston, it's from linden trees. Now you know what you're tasting, but also now you know what you can plant more of. So one of the things to stay tuned for later this summer, we're going to launch a new website with our nonprofit which is urbanbeelab.org. And that's where anybody around the world can go and see a map and you'll see a pop-up window for what the honey DNA results are for your area. And you can take that plant list to, let's say, your local garden center and then ask them, what, what's native here? What do you recommend that we plant more of? And this really comes down to what anybody can do, whether your honey is from trees, like a lot of places around us, or it's from flowers or clover, like we see in the Midwest around Chicago. Anybody can play a role at planting flowers to then improve bee health and make for a more sustainable food system and a more sustainable environment. 
So what don't people realize, getting back to urban beekeeping, I have a friend who, I I live downtown, I live in uh, Battery Park of Manhattan, and my friend, she has a hive in Tribeca and on her terrace. And I had the opportunity two summers ago to put on a suit and go in, open the hive and have that full experience, which was incredible. It was an incredible education. I wish everyone could have. Yeah. First of all, one, I didn't get stung once. The bees don't care about you. They really don't, Uh, you know. If you're a flower, you know. Yeah, if you're a flower, yes. But, you know, in general, they're not here to attack you. And so please, people, don't step on them, don't kill them, and just ignore them, and they'll ignore you. But that opening, I learned that the honey stays and and that you want to keep a little bit of honey for the hive so they can survive over the winter, right? But it, it was all contained there. And it was probably some of the most delicious honey that I've ever had. And I thought, oh, well, how, but, you know, Manhattan, like, why are they surviving here? You think that it can only be in the suburbs. But you went through a whole hypothesis that I, I was learning about on your TED Talk about pesticides and flowers and stuff. Can you kind of go into that? Like why you thought bees were doing better in the city than outside and what the surprising result was? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as I mentioned, I was interested in bees before. And then when we started doing some research around 2005, the bees started dying off and we needed to understand what was happening. So I started working with bees in 2005 2006, colony collapse disorder started, and that was really shocking because bees were just vanishing, not just dying off, but disappearing. And so we had to understand, well, what's going on with the bees and how can we better understand this? And so over time, the Best Bees Company was putting beehives all around cities and in the countryside. And so now we're, you know, 11 years into it, and we've got beehives all around the country, and we have a map and we can understand where they're thriving and where they're dying. So we ask, of course, why they're dying off, but we focus more on something more positive. Instead of why are bees dying, we say, why are they living? (laughs) So what we found just by chasing the network of beehives that we have, we've now got the largest data set of bee health in the, the world that's based on a standard beekeeping practice. All of our beekeepers do the same thing. And we found that bees are doing better in cities, just as you're saying, Christine. And that was totally baffling. I mean, why would they be doing great in Tribeca? I mean, even in in Battery Park, where you live, there's a great residential apartment building, residential real estate company called the Albanese Organization. And so they've had beehives on the rooftop there and they build community for all the tenants because there's so much honey to go around. Everybody, all the tenants get honey. They harvest it together. It's part of the community there. Wait. But other areas, like in the countryside, bees are dying and they're not producing honey. So why do we have in New York City apartment building communities harvesting honey together, kumbaya, <laughs> and then in the country, the pollinators are dead. Oh. So we started to investigate this. And of course, we were looking at the main killers of bees, so pesticides, diseases, um, habitat loss are the main three. Habitat loss are just aren't enough flowers because of development or farming practices that don't have enough flower diversity. If farms only have one crop instead of many crops, that can be death for pollinators that don't like that crop or when those blooms fall off. And so what we found was really surprising. We found that there were actually high levels of pesticides in cities It's not that there aren't pesticides. Pesticides are everywhere. But in cities, oftentimes, you know, people spray raid. They're just spraying things on their garden plot. Well, yeah. I mean, I wrote a book on this and I can say the air that we breathe is just filled with it. But but I was shocked that, I mean, but there's more in the city. I mean, it's, it is, it's sprayed in the parks. It's everywhere. It is everywhere. And so while, of course, we know pesticides can and they do kill bees and they have very detrimental effects on many things, Their absence alone did not explain why bees were doing better where they were. Mm. So I'm not saying that pesticides are no problem. I'm not saying pesticides are good for bees at all. I'm just saying that we find high levels of pesticides also where bees are doing okay. So they're two different things. Pesticides kill bees, yes. Yeah. And something else. Don't use them. Don't use them. (laughs) Yeah. Something else is going on on the other side, too. Let's dig further into the other factors. You know, what's helping them? What's what can we do the most? So we looked at diseases and we found something very similar. We found high levels of disease in many cities of bee diseases. 
And bees get many diseases. They have a, what's called a varroa mite, a little mite that came to the United States in 1987, is native to Southeast Asia. And so 1987 is a big year when the game changed, so to speak, when a lot of other diseases came because the mite, as we say, vectored other diseases that are bacterial, fungal, and viral. So the floodgates of of disease for bees came in the late 80s. And we see a lot of those in cities. And so again, like pesticides, diseases do kill bees, but their absence alone doesn't explain why bees are doing better in some places. Something else was going on there. And so we just had to keep digging deeper. You know, it was confusing. We found pesticides everywhere, we found diseases everywhere. What else is explaining some variation that we're seeing while we keep working on those? And what we came down to was habitat. That was the last of the three main hypotheses for what's killing bees. And we wanted to understand, is the habitat any different in cities compared to rural and and suburban areas? But we didn't know how to test that. You know, how do you measure habitat? How do you say how healthy and nutritious is, is this block, you know, is Battery Park compared to Westchester, compared to a farm in, in Pennsylvania? So what we did was look in the honey, and we found a way to use genomics technology, like a 23andMe or Ancestry DNA. Have you done those, Christine? I am actually researching my ancestry. Interesting, but I haven't done the saliva test. Okay. But tell me, yeah, so you can take saliva from bees and... Kind of, you know, it's the same technique. It's called genomics, and it's really just look, like forensics, looking at the DNA. So instead of bee saliva, well, what's another word for bee saliva-ish? So the honey. So you We're the honey. So we looked at honey because that's really where bees are telling us how the quality is. We put a hypothesis out there that the more plant species that we could find based on how many different types of DNA patterns there were the better the nutrition would be for bees based on kind of a buffet. If you're eating a diverse diet, you know, you eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, we make an assumption that you're healthier. You know, if you eat the same thing every day, I love pizza. I mean, New York pizza, come on. It's going to be good, but then you might not feel so well after, you know, a few weeks. So what we found did finally match up with our hypothesis here. We did find more plant species in cities based on the genomics test of honey, that honey DNA. We found actually eight times greater plant diversity in cities compared to their nearby countryside. And so this seems to be our leading hypothesis, as we would call it. It seems to be our our leading explanation for why bees might be doing better where they seem to be. And that seems to be in cities. And so in New York... I mean, maybe they're going to Central Park. Bees can fly for miles. Maybe they're gardens. Maybe there's even weeds coming up from the sidewalk, coming up from abandoned property. And the weed is like a misplaced flower. It's like a homeless flower. You know, it's just, you know, in the wrong spot, but it's still giving nutrition. And so we think that those are all things that are combining to make for a good habitat. And the last thing I'll add is the higher up you go, the better the bees are doing. And so in New York, you've got beehives over 70 floors up now. All of the empty rooftops, that's open habitat. And so what we've been doing with Best Bees and some other companies are doing green rooftops. We're doing pollinator gardens. We're finding once you put that habitat there for plants and for beehives, that we have a thriving community. We're seeing praying mantids, butterflies, bees. I mean, the life that comes up. So a whole movement now in New York and really around the world, it's called gray to green. This is inevitable. We're going to have green rooftops in the city. Yeah. We yeah. accept they're not. You're going to have carrots on the rooftop in Battery Park to feed your family. It yeah. is ridiculous how that is scandalous right now, but I say let this be your biggest problem. Let this be the work that we all do together, Christine, because we know it's coming and we know it's going to make the world a better place. Yes. I mean, green roofs here are now the law. We have a law that was passed uh, by a friend uh, who's no longer a council member, but was wrote the legislation, Rafael uh, Espinal. So yeah. that's incredible. That's leading the world, you know, It's leading the world. It is. And I'm looking right now out my window and I can see a green roof down there. And I, you know, I look and how do we get a hive? Like, Noah, how can I get a hive on my roof? Yeah. I mean, how much more pleasant is it to look at a green rooftop versus an ugly rooftop? Come on. 
And the temperature on green rooftops in the summer can be 40 yes. degrees lower than yes. a rooftop next door. Yes. We can That's, meet yeah. the temperature goals of the Paris Climate Accord with green rooftops in cities alone. Yes. So, I mean, it's inevitable. It saves money for operating costs for the lower HVAC by insulating buildings, the lower heating in the winter, lower AC in the summer, because it just, I mean, it, come on, we get this. It's like, it's you know, all good. There's nothing <laughs> so, bad about it, right? Well, you know, for us, and especially with best bees and any beekeepers that are out there for companies and for people who think that a green rooftop might be too much right now. It's like, oh gosh, we don't want solar panels all at once. You know, you start small, right? Let's okay. do something. So a little beehive is a great next step. You know, it only takes about a two by three foot space to put a beehive and that includes room for the beekeeper to stand. So, you know, at bestbees.com or if you follow us on social media, we've got a lot of great info there. We're just one option, but of course we're the best, the best bees. <laughs> But it's, it's a great way to start. And of course, anybody interested in learning to become a beekeeper, that's a wonderful thing. As you said, I mean, it was an amazing experience. It, it can be very relaxing. And so join a local beekeeping association. Anybody can just look up online. For, there's usually one by county or local communities. And the best thing about a local beekeeping association is they often have a school. So that's how you learn to become a beekeeper. So you can either do it yourself or hire a beekeeping service like Best Bees, but there's great options out there. And it's a great career. I can't think of anything more admirable than being a beekeeper and basically taking care of our food supply. It's you really becoming, you know, you're being a servant to society and to nature and and you, getting paid for it. How incredible. You know, and that's the first thing too. And I think in our changing world, we're going to start honoring older people with experience, things that people did as hobbies. I saw in the New York yeah. Times this week how there's evidence that the stimulus events from the government with the COVID pandemic triggered a massive amount of entrepreneurship, especially amongst black and brown communities. Yes. Even for myself, I got a fellowship in 2018 from a nonprofit called the Global Good Fund. They're amazing. And what they do is they support social impact entrepreneurs to make this change and to really try to create paying opportunities for people to get involved in this as movements, you know, to take it to the next level, just like we're doing on this podcast. Amazing. Amazing. So I have a small terrace. So if I wanted to do that, I could call your company or I could get my own and just start having bees and, and taking a class and learning about it, right? Yeah, so with Best Bees, we don't want to compete with any existing resources. So for us, we'll do it for you. If you have a terrace, if you have any gray space that we want to green it up, whether it's ground level, rooftop, terrace, deck, call us on in. We'll install and fully manage the beehive for you. We can harvest the honey for you. or We can show you how to harvest it. We'll pull the frame of honeycomb and then we can leave it for you or hand it off to you. Just kind of like the milkman came. We'll say, oh, here, you got honeycomb. You just squish it over a bowl. You know, we've done birthday parties for kids with it. It's a lot of fun. Um, and we'll collect research data. So each of the best bees <laughs> beehives, it's a data point. Now we partner up with MIT and NASA so to better understand the impacts of climate change on pollinator health and food systems. What we don't do is, is teach, and that's because we want to really support the local beekeeping clubs and other great resources. So in New York, okay. a great opportunity. There's another nonprofit in New York called the Bee Conservancy. We love them, and they really support community gardens, and especially with educational opportunities. So so many people in New York don't have a terrace, you know, or a rooftop that their landlord's going to say, oh, let's do something with it. There's, many landlords still say, oh, we got to keep it tar paper and keep it old and do nothing with it. So community gardens are a wonderful resource in New York and around the world. And now because the Bee Conservancy is supporting them, that's another opportunity for people to get involved. I'm thinking too, Noah, that, you know, you said before about this podcast and being the change and, and making that change. What about bringing uh, beekeeping and, and teaching as a skill to those incarcerated? You know, there's some incredible work being done about having community gardens within a prison and how people who work in the, those prisoners who have worked in the garden rarely have a, they have an extremely low reentry rate back into the prison system. Yeah, Susan Goldwitz is a name that comes to mind on this topic. I mean, she really is the leader that I know uh, across the United States for beekeeping educational programs in prisons. And this is something we've seen historically, okay. even with the government after World War I, there was a campaign for getting more vets into beekeeping. 
there's so much yeah. to learn. There's it's such a great service back to the community. And it's so calming and healing too for any sort of rehabilitation, any of you know the trauma that many people who are incarcerated have uh, entered prison with and certainly experienced there too. And this has been happening from coast to coast. So in part, thanks to Susan Goldwood's work and the way that we've helped support her even from Washington State's Department of Corrections. They've got a website, sustainabilityinprisons.org. You can check out some more about beekeeping Great. there and in Massachusetts as well. So definitely support these. We, we do want to see more of this because prison should really be a way to help get the community healing and better again. We can do yes, better. Yes, it should be a place of healing and it definitely isn't at this moment. So we can change that. Tell me about, I know we're not going to talk about the negatives, but I know people will want to know, you know, we knew all about the news, like in general population, right? The lay people out here, we knew about the colony collapse. Mm -hmm. We constantly hear about bees that they're dying off, that we don't have enough. Is this changing? Do we have better news? Do we know what's protecting them? You know, I work in environmental toxins, so I know, you know, I do a lot of work on banning glyphosate and getting that stopped and poisoning our crops as well as our bees. Tell me, like, where are we at with this? So it's tough. We're in a tough spot here and it's confusing. So let me address these two points and then I'd love to ask you a little bit more about what you're seeing as well. So with bees, we're seeing really from the Bee Informed Partnership and beeinformed.org. It's B-E-E, a little bee pun. That's a great resource, and that's a consortium. So we have hobbyist beekeepers that can contribute data from their own beehives. We've got larger groups like us at Best Bees. And then together, actually, we combine with our NASA project, too. So we've worked with them. They're great, out of the University of Maryland. And so we've seen more bee deaths than ever. About 44% of beehives die every year in the United States. Every year, it's about one in two. It's crazy. More of those beehives now die in the summer than do in the winter. So a sunny summer day in the United States is more deadly for a bee than a winter blizzard. Why? Let's let that sink in. It's insane. Yeah. So why? That's exactly what we're doing. So so many people are looking at what's killing bees. And you know, this is where I toss it back to you, Christine. So we know what's killing bees. We know what's been doing it. And we see with government policy you know, like the previous administration returning many yeah. pesticides to the shelves. Yeah. I do, you know, I gave a talk at Virginia Tech a few years ago about this, and they said, Noah, you have got to be careful about the topic of pesticides, because if you're out there saying, remove all the pesticides, people are just going to go back to the days of DDT. You know, growers have to address crop pests in some way. And I do get that. You know, I'm, I'm based on Cape Cod right now, and I understand mosquitoes. We already have them here. It's a big problem. And with invasive species, there's the Asian tiger mosquito that's come in, and so now they're emerging a month earlier than before. So there are pests out there, and I understand that conversation. And so when people use pesticides, I said, do it for a reason and do it as specified you know, if we have to have the conversation about what we're doing here, the other reasons, of course, diseases and habitat loss, you know, diseases, we're working on some medications. There's not a lot of progress being made. The varroa mite is just terrible. Bee breeding seems to be helpful. That's something that Best Bees is helping. Any of our client beehives that survives, we try to breed new bees from those healthy survivor stock and then plant flowers. But I'd love to know from you, what are you experiencing? What are you seeing on the pesticide side, Christine? Well, I think, you know, the the problem with the pesticides is that it's owned by generally one company that's also providing the seed, right? Which is Monsanto, which everyone knows about. And I think it was fantastic to have that groundbreaking case of where, you know, fortunately the gentleman is going to have to die of cancer But showing that, you know, he was a groundskeeper in San Francisco and indeed got cancer from spraying the the Roundup pesticide. Now, that said, you know, and I also have family who are farmers and they deal directly with corn and, and soybean crops, which are going to feed animals. Just a whole other discussion, right? It's where most of our crops grown right now are mass. Um, There's no biodiversity and it's going to feed the livestock and not actual humans. And then there's also a study came out that, you know, everyone's looking at like vaccines, which are in fact saving lives. But the reality is that this glyphosate and these pesticides may actually be causing the things like autism. You know, there's a study that just came out on it. I mean, it's at Harvard or, you know, it's a legitimate study. It's not just something, you know, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. So 
I'm looking at that and then I find it, but like you said, then you have the information whereas there's more pesticides in the city than there is in the suburbs or in the country. But why are beeves able to survive here with the pesticides that we have in the city? And then I have to wonder if it's not biodiversity, like that biodiversity is really what we need to, to survive at all species need to survive. You're talking about the insects, right? And how the people are annoyed by that. But here in, I had a friend go out into the country, you know, which is upstate here or whatever. And she was a friend from France was shocked that there weren't hardly any insects and that we're killing off all this biodiversity because we see them as pests and that, yeah. Right. It's amazing, Christine, and and I love hearing you say, you know, people don't want to hear it because I'm pissing them off, but let people get pissed, you know, as long as they talk and get engaged, you know, when somebody's pissed, they're feeling something and they care. And that's because maybe they're experiencing something too. And maybe there's so much pressure from one big corporation. We've got to have this dialogue. And so I think from the science perspective, what we do know exactly as you're saying from the studies, we see that when bees are eating honey, which is their food, you know, they can better than metabolize pesticides, some of them, and they can better withstand disease. And so what I'm saying here is that just like with us humans, we know if we're healthy, if we're eating a healthy diet, if we're getting our sleep, we can better withstand the stressors and the things that the world may throw at us. It's not saying we're going to survive things. No. It's saying like right. we're bring on the stressors. It's just that same concept that really makes bees a good study system to better understand health, immunology, nutrition, you know, how we're dealing in our modern world. Bees are getting wiped out. For yeah. sure. And maybe if they have a good diet, maybe they can be a little healthier. You know, who knows? But it is a bit of a moot point that we're just going to keep adding on all of these stressors and not talking about it because people are pissed. I mean, I applaud the work you're doing, Christine, because we got to get people at the table. That's why I'm always happy to talk to anybody about this. You know, I'll talk to a yeah. pesticide company never had before, but we got to have these conversations and it starts here. Yeah, it's very interesting. I, I had the opportunity to speak at a conference about it, (laughs) about chemicals also, because I also own a home fragrance company that I've had for 25 years called The Good Home Company. And we were plant-based, right? And it's not perfect. There aren't any cleaning products. And listen, unless you're using a pure Castile soap and vinegar and baking soda, the things are made from petroleum and and which is still nature. I mean, it's a very complex thing. So anyhow, it's not perfect, but I'm trying to make it perfect. You know, that's like they, the, I mean, it's the quest, you know, for a more perfect union, you know, yeah. for such a short time. And so I really applaud the work you're doing, you know, well, it's not perfect because you're working at it. And the event, they hired me to speak and it was an event that was, you know, I did a whole lecture on it and it was sponsored by Dow Chemicals. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I remember I was speaking to my husband and I took the train to DC and then went there, you know, it was right across from, you know, in Virginia, how you can just go over the bridge and you're there, right? At this, ho- you know, hotel. And I said, Todd, it's sponsored by Dow Chemical. Like, I mean, I don't, you know, here I go. So I went in and I just, I talked about it. But the thing is, is that here's what I also found very interesting, though, is that in speaking there and talking about it and always trying to find the answers, it comes down to money and it comes down to power. And in my opinion, and I spoke to, you know, seventh generation, which was, you know, a legitimate company was purchased by, I don't know, it's one of the big three, right? And and so they had people there and I was like, why don't you guys have your, you know, you had more recyclable paper cartons and stuff. What happened to that? I'm jealous of that. As a small company, that's not available to me. Yeah. I mean, as right? you say, money and power, it's also opportunity. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so you're thinking as a small business, if you had the opportunity to do that packaging, you know, then you could make another step ahead. I would do it. I would do it. But they said, you know, the cost factor for them. And so that's why they got rid of it. And so then it's just at what point, Noah, at what point we will have to stop. And I think we are in that decade. I think 2020 brought it on where people have stopped and are really thinking about it. Yeah. And, you know, people like you and me and everyone listening and out there in the community are, are being the change are changing yeah. that. You know, as an evolutionary biologist myself, you know, with MIT, talking about all of these things, I think about selection pressure. That's a fancy term for forces. Right near what you're saying 
in business, there's a force against the sustainable packaging. And that's just an evolutionary factor because time goes on and then we figure something else out. So it's never, ever the end of the road, even if it's the end of our lives. All of the work that we're putting out there, all the conversations we're having, even when the opportunity presents, let's say when Dow Chemical says you go up on a stage, or one time I did win a prize in grad school with Dow, I got to go to Michigan, I'd never been, it was amazing. These are opportunities that we've got to take, because especially right now with, in cancel culture, there's so much division, and there's so much that we're not talking about. We're saying, oh, you're that, well, I'm this, and that's that. We're not going to talk. Yeah. And so Christine, we're starting here. We're talking about it and we're naming names, yeah. right? Because we want to talk. Because when they say, oh, we're going to give you the stage, you do take it. You don't say, oh, no, nope, you're canceled. I'm not going to do it. And I'm going to sit here. And even though I want and need better packaging, I'm not talking to you. So this yeah. is the next. This is our evolution for the society that we're helping out with. There's got to be more of this because this cancel culture cannot persist. We've got to come back to the table. That's what we're doing here. Oh, no, I love you. I love you. You just. You bring it all together. I listened to a podcast. It was, oh God, I'm messing it up. It's Ian Bremmer's podcast. And they were talking about climate change. And But they were talking to people like Citibank. And that's exactly it, is that to think that this cancel culture, like a great idea. Okay, so we're going to just stop flying, right? We're going to all just stay here and then we're not going to, you know, and that's not possible. It's not, it's middle. We have to get into the middle to survive, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've been starting to do more and more keynote talks. And so noahwilsonrich.com to finding out more and with companies like Citibank, or I was with The Gap a couple of weeks ago for Earth Day. Uh, you had this morning and yesterday, JP Morgan Chase, you know, they're getting bees at all their campuses. And so we're moving beyond, and, you know, we talked about cancel culture, but greenwashing is a big word now when companies are saying they're sustainable, but it's all talk. And so a way to move beyond that is now you get a beehive. And then and the next step after the beehive and after we're talking about it to the stakeholders and the community, and now every after every investor and employee has honey, now we're going to get a pollinator habitat. And then we're going to say, oh, we're not going to use chemicals on this, you know, if at least for our little plot of land that was an empty rooftop or an empty terrace. So this is the future. And I know that we can see this happening. And, you know, the way to put some more opportunities in place is really to start engaging with these companies, I think, to yes. fund keynotes. You know, Christine, I'm so glad to hear that you're doing all of these things with your company and your talks and your podcasts and your books from the UN to New York. You know, this is <laughs> so great that I'm so excited to see what's next for you and for me because we're going to well, keep I appreciate up. that. But come on, Noah. I mean, you're the bee. You're, <laughs> you're the king bee. <laughs> I mean, I honestly, thank you. I appreciate it. And I, and that's what this is about is that it's going to come down. One person can be the change. And the listeners can be the change. And know this fact that most pesticides are actually used on suburb lawns than they are in our industrial agriculture, right? So they're killing the bees. So right now, if you're listening, what you can do is stop using it. Stop using Roundup. And would you suggest, Noah, that they could like let their lawn grow and have clover? Yes. And Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So whether you're a homeowner or whether you are a government or a company, consider a no mow policy. You save the money, you save the time, you just don't mow it. And you let a lawn turn into a meadow. <gasps> Gasp. No. Oh no. What are the neighbors going to think? The neighbors are going to love your butterflies, right? They're going to love your honey, right? Because when you start seeing bees there, you're going to think, who's stealing our honey? Why doesn't my family get this fresh, delicious local honey? Yeah. We can start tasting our neighborhood, helping our allergies. So it really is a no brainer. And so we're seeing this happen with state governments along the side of the highway. Even the University of Connecticut's been getting involved with departments of transportation for the no-mo policies, right? Save that money, help the environment. When you have solutions that match with the environment and finance, whether it's green rooftops and real estate companies saving money, whether it's companies that get beehives to share the honey with the employees and the, the shoppers and tenants for leasing and sales and marketing, whether it's homeowners who just want to say, I'm going to let my lawn grow. I'm not going to do Roundup. I'm not going to spray a chemical on a dandelion. If you really don't want it there, you pull it. And then you put it in your compost bin because that goes into your garden and it turns into food for your family. So these solutions, it might make you feel a little crunchy it might make you think oh a couple generations ago they wouldn't have done that a couple generations ago they actually did <laughs> they didn't have these chemicals you know so it's really important to take a step back and question things why are we doing this do i have to do it this way do i have to spend the money yeah you really don't 
No, you don't. Yeah, exactly. Let it go wild. One thing before we close, I'm going to ask you a question here. Is is it okay to be eating honey? I have that question. Like, is the grocery store honey, is that an industrialization of the bee? Is that good? Is that bad? So yes and no. So there was a show on Netflix, I think it was called Rotten, and maybe episode one talked about the honey industry globally and how problematic it can be because honey is often adulterated. It's an adulterated food, and that's why it's so important to know your beekeeper, know where the honey comes from, buy locally. When honey is sold for a very low price, you know, sometimes a dollar yeah. or you know, a big jar. It's often not real honey. It's often high fructose corn syrup or sugar water that's been fed to bees. And then it matches the definition of honey according to the farm bill with the Department of Agriculture, which despite my best efforts to define honey as plant-based, it's not. It's defined as anything that goes through a bee. Wait, what? What? Wait, wait, go back there because I didn't know about this. Yeah. Cheaper honey, bees are like, they're basically... Being pumped full of sugar water, high fructose corn syrup, and then that gets kind of through a bee because bees will concentrate it. Bees take a liquid from about 90% water down to about 18 to 20% water. So let's say sugar water, you know, like a a simple syrup for cocktails. You're just dissolving sugar and boiling water. Bees will then concentrate it and they make a thick like syrup. People can call that honey because the legal definition, according to the government for honey, is anything that goes through a bee. And what I want it to do, and really with our honey DNA analysis, what we can now do is by looking at the plant DNA genome, we can identify, oh, yeah, this is honey. This is 17% clover, 18% daisy, you know, 4% roses. We're not there yet. And so this is why it's so important when you're thinking about food, when you have a choice, you know, if you can afford, you know, to not buy one dollar, you know, cheap honey, I get it. Not everybody can. And that's okay. We're not there yet as a society. But when you're thinking about honey, buy local, know your beekeeper, reach out to local beekeeping association, become a beekeeper, get bees. You know, now that there are options, whether you do it yourself or you hire a service to do it for you, you know, creating jobs for people, there are more opportunities now than ever for everybody, whether it's just learning and discussing or actually doing. Amazing. Exactly. Have your own hive. Here's also another idea. You could use less. Like, I think that's one of the big solutions here, right? Is that I was learning the process of making honey to make just one teaspoon of honey is phenomenal and is incredible efforts on the parts of bees, right? Just one teaspoon. And that's something I think of nothing about putting that in my coffee in the morning, but now I do. Yeah, no, I do. Amazing. Yeah, and the, the social media channels yeah. for best bees, we're always dropping like little tidbits. You know, how many bees does it take to make a teaspoon? How many flowers does a bee visit? Yeah. And it really helps put this into perspective. And, you know, for a lot of people, especially these days, when we're thinking about stress, anxiety, yeah. you know, working at home, dealing with families and kids and nutrition, it's too much. And so a lot of people are doing gratitude lists. You know, you wake up in the morning, write three things down that you're grateful for that day to just kind of get centered. And I think that there are ways to extend that to be on the list. So like you're saying, Christine, when you're adding a spoonful of honey to something, you think about, wow, a lot of work went into making this. It's not just yeah. like scooping my peanut butter. You know, there's so much more that's gone into our food system than we appreciate. People don't really connect at the grocery store. I'm getting this food because people made it. Uh, food comes from the store. Food comes from the bodega. Yeah. And so there's so much more work we can do to be grateful for the system. And especially as it gets more complex, thinking about the pesticides or lack thereof and why food costs the way it does, the more yeah. demand there is for organic foods that didn't involve pesticides, the prices will come down. So, you know, the future's bright. We've got a little work to do and it starts here. Yes, absolutely. Noah, before we go, I have a, a question for you. So I know that you have absolutely have a passion and that this is your work, but I also know it's not without challenges and that you, you know, you hold some uh, heavy things in your hands and information and what keeps you going? What keeps you being the change and, and not stopping? You know, it's so amazing, Christine. And I wonder if you experience this too. People genuinely care and not everybody gets it. You know, when people, I had a cocktail party, I often will not say what I do. I'll say I'm a scientist because I don't want to like, if I say bees, that's the topic of conversation. Everybody wants to talk about that in a way that makes me feel shy and you know blush. And of course, I'm grateful for them and happy to talk about it. 
But that's what keeps me going. People really care and they want to know. And again, not everybody cares. If people see hear bees, especially in New York City people, you know, it's like, oh, they don't want to know. That's gross. I worked with, with one company recently. It was City, actually. Yeah, I have a great colleague there at their networking group and they were going to get bees and then it was nixed because they said, oh, it's against our pest control policy. I was like, this is, okay, let's do some work together because these are not pests. This is like Los Angeles made bees illegal in the 1870s, June 9th of 1879, I think is the date. I wrote about this in the LA Times in 2015 because people thought that bees stole our food. They didn't understand pollination. And that law stuck on the books until 2015, where LA finally legalized beekeeping. You know, just like New York finally legalized beekeeping in 2010, because there's all this misinformation that, that bees are attacking and killing people. When those are hornets and yellow jackets and wasps, you know, this is different. We've got to understand this. So when people get it, when they're open to talking about it, that tells me I got more work to do. I've got to keep answering their questions and inform them because I'm going to die one day. And there's only so many TED Talks one can give. How many books can I right and you know how many keynotes i've got to help scale this and so that possibility of scaling and doing something impactful with my short time on earth like our conversation here that's what keeps me going what keeps you going christine to help others it's a drive to help others and to help better myself and society and everything living on the planet yeah, yeah including us yeah including us and our kids, you know, I found just to add one last thing, we work with a wonderful landscape architect firm in the New York area called Hollander. And they work with a lot of high net worth individuals, very conservative people who aren't so, you know, care, they don't care as much about the environment as maybe some other people do. But what everybody cares about is healthy food for kids, the next generation. That's what everybody cares about. And so maybe we can leave it off on that note. If not for us, maybe we do it for them. Exactly. For the children. Yeah. Thank you, Noah. It's just been a joy. Can you please tell us how we can find you again and, and where people can get involved? Thank you, Chris. List them all. List them all. You're the best. Okay. So I'm Noah Wilson Rich and NoahWilsonRich.com. That's my website, especially for keynote events. If anybody wants to hire a speaker, I'd love to talk more about this. And especially if we get bees on campus, the talk will then have some legs, you know, six legs of bees. It's my nerdy science pun. Um, bestbees.com is my company. So check us out there too. And our social media at Best Bees. Christine, thank you again. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you, Noah. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and are inspired. We grow with supporters and listeners like you. So please share this podcast with your community and follow us on Instagram at bethechange.nyc. And to learn more about our guests and what you can do to be the change, go to our website at www.bethechange.nyc. That's bethechange.nyc. Thank you and be well.